Morning, Michael. Morning. Um, I am a, really interested today because we're going to be talking about Owen Barfield again. <clears throat> and I wanted to approach it from the standpoint of really trying to nail down what Barfield means by participation. And I, I had mentioned last time that I'd gotten very interested in Chloe Baldry and some of her ideas wrapped around story. And uh, so I was listening to an interview between Chloe Baldry and Coleman Hughes. And uh, <clears throat> Chloe Baldry was discussing her concept of paradox. She does music and, and her music is under the name of paradox. And so he was asking her, why do you like that? name of paradox and so she was explaining it so i want to show a little clip of that to get us started um, but before i do i wanted to also just run through a little matrix that i think is kind of important we've heard it said that politics is downstream of culture and i recently read another quote that said culture is downstream of communication and i think barfield even though he didn't use this kind of um, analogy, I think he would say that communication is downstream of language. So if we don't understand the role that language plays in the way that we establish meaning in the world, then um, we're going to build our whole edifice on a house of cards, basically. So I thought it would be interesting to look at Chloe of Aldery and then take it from there and try to tease out the difference between paradox and participation. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds like a good day. Good fun. Okay, I will share the screen here and we'll look at Chloe Valdery. Just a one minute of this. Uh, when I think of biblical figures like King David, for example, who was a very paradoxical figure, who was someone who, um, who, you know, as the story goes, as a young man, slayed Goliath and found favor with God, but also uh, committed incredible sins and in, in, in uh, committing adultery and murdering someone in order to get the woman that he wanted and neglecting his sons as a father. And yet all, he had all these qualities and, and vices, but he was also still ultimately known as, quote unquote, a man after God's own heart. And that complexity um, I think is quite beautiful. And, and if we, as a society or as a culture, were to study that complexity and internalize uh, the ability to hold space for two seemingly disparate ideas, qualities at once, I think we would be a, a much healthier society. Um, and so paradox does that. Also, do so I'm going to stop there um, because that's the last thing that she says about paradox and she goes into talking about music which is also very interesting so I'll, I'll put a link to the video underneath our thing here but um, I wondered what you had if you had any thoughts about that yeah I think <clears throat> I don't know I, I, I it, it makes me think of Ian McGochrist and the the kind of the different halves of the hemisphere of the brain and that they're they have different ways of seeing and that we, we need both, you know, and there isn't ever going to be a perfect mapping from one to the other. There isn't even, I don't think there's even a way of saying, because some people, I think they react against well, what, what they perceive as left brain uh, dominated activities. And they think, well, we we're going to overset that with the hierarchy of the right brain or whatever. I, I think, there's a there's this kind of adversarial nature at play here where you want one to win out sometimes and you want the other one to win out sometimes and you never you never really know and 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 so to maintain to maintain that adversarial structure you need to embrace what she's talking about which is the paradox there's a there's a both and instead of an either or Yes, and, and that's, that's a very rich thread right there that we can pursue. There's also the thread running through there of this idea of the paradox that it's not as though a person is all good or all bad, but that there is a, 
a line that runs right down the center of the human heart with good on one side and evil on the other. So David had both of those things going on in him at one time. And somehow, as human beings, we have to live out the paradox of that, in, but live it out towards one direction that is more, um, not a direction that unites those two, right? So there is a paradox that, that King David had both of those aspects to him, but when you, when you hold both of them loosely, you're not, um, you're not saying that both are of equal value mm -hmm. in that particular instance, because on the one side were all the terrible things that he did, and on the other side were all the good things that he did. So um, the paradox there is that in spite of those things, David could be seen as a man after God's own heart. So, so there's another nested paradox of a human being who can be uh, united with God's thoughts and at the same time have all the complexities and corruption of the human nature. So there's that paradox going on. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Well, in David's life, there were so many paradoxes. <laughs> I guess we could spend all day on him, which I don't really want to do. But, but I did want to say, the reason I played that clip is that I've been reading Owen Barfield's Saving the Appearances, which I recommend to people just because it really does a number on your brain and you have to think very, very hard to read it. Um, yeah, it's a definitely he, an expander of consciousness. Yes. He talks in here about this idea of participation. And um, I'm going to briefly outline what I think he's saying, and then I would love to have you correct me because I know I don't have it fleshed out. I haven't read as much of his work as you have. So I'm just going to give a, a summary of what I think is happening, and then you can fill it out for me. Um, we know from quantum physics that the world consists of particles that we can't see. But somehow our consciousness makes sense out of those particles and sees things. And these things or, or people or these things that we see that, are, that consist underneath in what he calls the unrepresented we represent those things with um, an image that is collectively agreed upon. We see something and we all agree that's a dog. Um, if I see that and I say it's a lion, but everybody else says it's a dog, <laughs> then I'm probably the one that's wrong because the collective representation is saying that's a dog. And uh, in times past, in early history, when people developed these representations of things with their consciousness, they were more fully participating in something that went beyond simple intellectual grasp of the thing something that was deeper had more of a connection to the meaning that was inherent in the thing not just in the visual representation of the thing um, one of the examples he uses in the around page 85 90 somewhere in there is he's talking about how the ancients used to view blood and the way that blood circulated in the, in the human system. And so I got to thinking about that. That's one word that in a sense, we still have a little bit of a sense of participation with that because we understand that blood is a thing and it has scientific truths that every, people have figured out about it and the way it works in the human body, but also that blood has some other kind of deeper meaning. 
symbolic meaning, metaphoric meaning to it, that we intuit just based on the way that blood is represented in stories, um, the way blood is represented in the Bible, the way blood is represented when we talk about somebody being cold-blooded or warm-blooded or hot-blooded. Those all have different meanings as though blood itself has some richer history attached to it as a word. And so when we hear the word, we kind of enter into that deeper meaning. Is, is that the basic idea of what he's talking about with, rep, with um, participation? You know what, the, the, the passage in there, I always kind of stumped me what he's talking about. Um, I think what he's getting at is that actually you participate with blood because it's, it's what enables you to do everything right now. Like you participate with it because it's a functional part of who you are and all your conscious experiences because it's, I don't think he's talking about it in an intellectual way. Um, I think it's more of a, <clears throat> I mean, the, the so in, in the, the, repre- uh, the examples he uses like bad blood or um, hot blood or things like that that we would re- use to refer to certain emotional states. I guess what he, he's seen the connection between that and our basic physical composition, whereas today we have this sort of weird idea that, I don't know, like our, there's this weird disconnection between mind and body or, or even in its most extreme examples that mind is just a, a some sort of weird quirk of body um it's some sort of illusion um but yeah i i, I i'm not sure exactly what he's talking about in those one because he, he what he basically says there is that uh, we participate in blood until the moment that we shed it and suddenly when we see it we we have this now we have this we were we are thrust back into this sort of scientific i don't know understanding of of the blood is this uh i I don't really know how to describe it um well but yeah that one comes to your when when it becomes a conscious representation when you can see it it's now it's no longer something that's yeah when when he talks about blood i just find it very it stumps me every time I've, i've spent a lot of time meditating on it i'm not sure exactly so if there's anybody out there who gets it I feel like it's, uh, I, I don't. <laughs> well, so let me pick a simpler thing then. Let's just take a tree. Okay. If, if the tree is a representation. It's a collective representation. We all look at it. We all see it. So he would call that a collective representation. In what sense did the ancients participate with that? And we don't participate. Because that's what he's saying. We no longer yeah. participate. I don't think we can know. I think we can, I think the best we can do in a lot of cases is, I don't think it's recoverable, whatever that original participation is. Um, I think we can get at it and like we can get kind of little glimpses of it when we, 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 we read really old texts. But even then we have to, kind of diligently not read back into them the ways we would we would understand what they're saying. So um, I don't know if you've heard Mark Vernon talk about his interactions with Plato. And and this is kind of what's what brought him down the path where he started interacting with with Barfield was when he was reading Plato, Plato spends all this time talking about the environments where the dialogues take place with him and Socrates. And those and they be, they, and in his modern frame, he would kind of just edit those out. Those aren't really part of the propositional elements of what's occurring here. But then over time, he realized that there was perhaps some more cohesive and holistic way of, of that those were part of something, some broader reality that uh, Socrates is interacting with in the dialogues. And um, I think that, holistic mode of being is lost to us at least for i feel like it is for me i feel like i have uh, glimpses of it in certain moments but i i think it, it is so well practiced in me to place on a hierarchy of values the propositional and the intellectual 
as a mode of being, mm -hmm. I don't know that I get out of it very often, but that maybe that's, that's probably unique to me maybe as well. Some, some of my own personality and predilections as well. Well, let, let's, let's boost it over to the idea of story a little bit, because when you were saying that about his experience with reading Plato, it, all of a sudden it just reminded me of a, a time years ago when I tried to read the book, Ben-Hur. I had seen the movie, so I thought, well, you know, and then after I became a Christian, I remembered, oh, the movie had some kind of Christian elements to it, so maybe it would be an interesting book to read. So I got the book, and I tried to read the book. <laughs> and he spends probably the first 50 pages setting the scene, just establishing what the desert looked like and how the city was constructed and and every single aspect i mean the you know the way the wind felt on their skin and just completely just setting the scene for like 50 pages and everything in me was just like come on get to the point get to the get to the story <laughs> and i realized how how i've been ruined by television and movies and and uh, the way that stories are fed to us now we see story when when you watch a a movie script or a tv show things are given to you in like 20 second or 50 second clips and then they 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 condense as much action as they can into this very brief moment and then you move from one moment to the next moment but mm -hmm. The only way you get a sense of the environment is all is, is a visual look at it while you're experiencing the action with, with the characters. So um, because we don't read those old kinds of books anymore that spend so much time engaging our imaginative machinery on what that environment actually felt like to the human person, when these things were happening um we we just lose a lot yeah well i think you know barfield would say we don't that imaginative machinery that we use to see in our heads and this was also in the verveki mark vernon talk that i sent you that's the same machinery we use to actually see the world too and so we we don't we don't have uh we don't see the world in, in a cohesive way even when we're just looking at it and i think there's the idea in barfield and going back into even to steiner who was who was a great influencer on barfield is um this sort of the ways in which our our imaginative practices our spiritual practices can can change the way we see the world. Um, like actually the way we see it with our eyes, what becomes salient, what, how it coheres together, how it tells a single story. You know, you were bringing up the example of the tree. There is a story there, but I don't think we see it, or at least I don't. <laughs> I, I, can, I can be led via breadcrumbs of people smarter than me into a, a sort of imagined perspective on things. But uh, um, I, I'm, I think there does need, in terms of going back to some sort of more final participation, there does have to be some set of practices, some sort of set of perhaps even physical, you know, imaginative practices that we need to engage with communally. There's a communal aspect to this too, because again, as Barfield points out, it's there, the representations are collective. We, we not only form them within our own consciousness, but we somehow inherit and imbibe them from those around us. Um, and so those, the, the communal aspect to those practices is really important. And perhaps conversations like this where we're, and I think to, to the extent to which we don't go into a conversation with just like, here's a list of things I want to say, which mm -hmm. I'm, I, which is my default mode, but we actually are like kind of listening for something more and, and, uh, and trying to become in touch with something more. You know, this is the whole 
God in the conversation kind of thing that we've, we keep hitting on, we can potentially engage in that, um, as, as a, as a practice. Um, but again, extremely difficult because it's, we are wired to a different frequency in, in the cultural mil milieu of what we're, we're surrounded by. Well, so since our imaginative machinery right now is mainly intellectual and analytical <laughs> and probably dialectical, um, what about just the using that machinery that we have, but expanding our, our ground a little bit, so to speak, by <clears throat> by learning more about, well, and, and here's where the problem lies, I guess. People are already stretched to their capacity just managing whatever their job is because there's so much to know about everything. <laughs> but if you have a complex job, just keeping up with that is all you can handle. But, but in the places where I know just a little bit more about something, my life is so much richer. So when I think about a tree, uh, my daughter and I went walking in the big trees down around um, Mount Hermon a couple of days ago. And because I know a little bit about how those big trees grow, the stories just flood into me as I'm looking at them. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that the mother tree gives her life after the babies are born around the outside of her and she gives her life to nourish all the baby trees that come out around and the, and the reason that the trees are able to stand tall for thousands of years is not because they have big deep root systems but because their root systems intersect with each other underground and and the uh, the seed of the sequoia tree must go through a fire before it can fall into the ground and bear a new tree and and so there's all these deep stories woven into the life of the tree and then you see one of the you see a cross section of some tree that's fallen down and they marked off on the tree all of the uh, tree rings to show how old this tree is and, and the one they've got there is 2200 years old so they show on the tree rings the birth of Christ and the, the signing of the Magna Carta and you can see all of history played out in the life of this one tree and you start to get some sense of what it means to participate with the larger meaning of the of the universe but it takes it takes living those stories out hearing them making them a part of you it becomes so much a part of you that when you see the thing all those stories are dwelling in you at the same time yeah um My brain wants to go in so many different directions. Um, Just pick one, we'll follow it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read that. My mom. So I I actually got married this past weekend. Um, what? what? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's like a we're we're still doing like a trip later uh, in a in a couple of weeks where we're gonna do like a kind of like a symbolic thing with a photographer and whatnot. But we wanted our parents to be involved in the legal thing so we did a a legal ceremony with uh, our parents and um congrats it's funny because michael thank you and listen um, i didn't know when your wedding was going to be but i wanted to give you a painting for your wedding so i just need you to tell me what kind of a painting you'd like and how big you want it to be and i'll, I'll give you a, a wedding as a, a painting okay. As a wedding gift. okay so think okay about i will i will think about that but anyway so my mom afterwards when we came back to the house after um the ceremony we went to a park nearby which this park is full of these giant oaks uh, trees keep coming up so I'm, I'm thinking about trees but she she read this poem <clears throat> about uh i think it's about an oak tree um but it starts defeat may serve as well as victory to shake the soul and let the glory out when the great oak is straining in the wind the boughs drink in new beauty and the trunk sends down a deeper root on the windward side. 
Only the soul that knows the mighty grief can know the mighty rapture. Sorrow has come to stretch out spaces in the heart for joy. And um, wow, wow, what a great thought! But I, I think within that is that that paradox that you were talking about earlier. There, where there's, I don't know. I I, I keep running across this theme in my own life of of redemption, which I always, it's a, it's a conjoining of the suffering and the beauty and the joy in the world. And um, I, I think that's what uh, C.S. Lewis was talking about when he talked about sin such or whatever uh, that, that German word is. I, I think it's, it's this combining of things together that is, uh, it's, it has this sort of ephemeral quality when you interact, interact with it. Um, and, and for C.S. Lewis, he always thought you couldn't really get at it. You, he had his uh, divisions between the contemplated and the enjoyed. Um, but I think what Barfield was getting at is that there's this stuff is it's actually really everywhere. It's really, and there is a, Part of part of why I think C.S. Lewis always has this division between the contemplated and the enjoyed is because for him, on the contemplation side, it's always about control. It's about the the modern analysis. It's about cutting it into smaller bits so you can have certainty about the way in which you understand it. You've basically cut the thing apart, and it's lying lifeless on the floor. But there's another way of contemplating something that has more to do with like the history of the church and the monks and like contemplative prayer and a sort of a same sort of practice of mind that isn't about cutting things apart, but pulling, putting them together. And I think that kind of, it's, it's kind of that reciprocal opening that, uh, that Verveke is talking about. Maybe, I don't know if they're, the same thing, but I, the, the two align in my own kind of con conceptual universe. They, they seem, there seems like there's a similarity there. Um, and so, and some part of each level of, of that reciprocal opening involves you taking on some new level of paradox of things that you can't understand that don't make sense within your frame. And if you wanted to stop and like logically figure it out, you immediately stop the experience. But when you are allowing this heightened sense of beauty and contemplation of whether it's God or nature or other things you can, I don't know, I've, I've had these experiences where if it, it seems to be what, what C.S. Lewis is describing, but it's not so ephemeral. I, I have a sense in which I can lean into it and experience more of it rather than just like this sort of grasping and like, okay, now as soon as I think about it, it's gone. Um, and for me, my own turn, my own journey back to faith from being away from it really began with my examination of such moments and trying to figure out what was going on with them. And, and then the more I engaged with it, the more I kind of saw a reality there that was everywhere. It wasn't just some sort of personal, I don't know how to say this, like some sort of person, like I, the way I engaged with it when I first saw it was like, okay, this is some sort of accidental mode of my own being that I've, you know, I've fallen into because of, you know, life circumstances, blah, blah, blah. And there was some of that. Obviously, my personal lens and frame was, was, was part of how I seen the world, but it was the sense of being in touch with something larger. That's what transformed me and made me, made me willing to engage with things that I couldn't explain or take or to believe and put confidence and faith into things that are beyond, uh, you know, my, my modern man's ability to, to quantify and uh, measure and, uh, and have certainty about.
Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> oh, no, no, it was, it was really good. There's, there's two things that came up for me. One was that in the, uh, in the video you sent me about Mark Vernon and John Verveke, when Mark Vernon is talking about how it was his study of Plato that led him to realize that he was missing something about the way the ancients saw the world, he said he came to a realization that, that words that would typically show up in any other philosopher's work aren't even a part of Plato's vocabulary. And he, for example, he never uses the word analysis. And it, it, it was occurring to me that the difference between the contemplated and the enjoyed in the sense that C.S. Lewis was using it is that contemplated bears within it a sort of analysis. Mm -hmm. You take in something, you start thinking about it, you start analyzing it as you're You start breaking it down into pieces that are small enough for your puny little finite self to interact with. Yeah, yeah. And that when Plato was discussing his ideas, he wasn't so much using this tool of analysis. He, he had some more global sense of, of taking in that taking in the world that we have lost some of. So that was one thought that came to me. <clears throat> the other thought that came to me <clears throat> when you mentioned the idea of allowing the heightened sense of beauty to lean into it and to allow it to, to take you, so to speak, to allow it to, to allow yourself to participate in this heightened sense of beauty. Well, two things there as well. You had sent me an email in which you talked about the etymology of the word participate. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I thought maybe, do you remember that? Where you did the, the etymological study of the word participate? Yeah, that it, yeah. It, it shows up right before the Protestant Reformation. And I was, what I was sent to you in the email, I was thinking perhaps, perhaps, we didn't have a word for it before because it was just kind of our, our default mode of being. But then as we started kind of sliding away from it, perhaps we now needed a word to describe something that we were in the process of kind of losing. Which I think is such an interesting idea about how language develops that we, that we tend to start needing a word when we no longer have the lived experience. <laughs> as a default mode, we just have to, we have to find a word now to describe it and, you know, try in some way to hold on to it. So I, th I thought that was just really, really good. But the other thing that, that occurred to me, and this is a very weird idea. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know if it's even okay to have ideas like this, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway. So I was reading page 95 in, uh, in this book, Saving the Appearances by Barfield. And uh, so he says, for the world is the thought of God realized through his word. Thus, the divine word is also forma exemplaris. The phenomena are its representations, as the human word is the representation of intellectus in actu. But once again, the phenomenon itself only achieves its full reality, and then he puts in parentheses, actus, A-C-T-U-S. The phenomenon itself only achieves its full reality, actus, in being named or thought by man. And I don't know why, but when I read that sentence, I all of a sudden had this like, impact this picture came into my mind of the thing that i've been talking about with you in the past about faith is the substance of things hoped for <clears throat> i'm going to read his sentence again the phenomenon itself <clears throat> only achieves its full reality actus in being named or thought by man did you need a sorry did you need a minute say again um, the phenomenon itself only achieves its full reality, actus, in being named or thought by man. 
here he's talking about this idea that the ancients, when they named something, that the name itself was more than just a word. That the act of giving a name to something was a very meaningful act because the mm -hmm. name itself carried more than just a, an etymological power. It actually carried some of the essence mm -hmm. somehow. But so when, when we, if we're thinking about quantum physics and we see in the particles, which are, we see inside the unrepresented, which are the particles, we don't see the unrepresented, we only see the represented, the thing that we see there, the, the object, we name the object. That is the, the act of it coming into reality. Um, so at the beginning of the paragraph that I read, he says, for the world is the thought of God realized through his word. That's what Jordan Peterson's talking about when he says that which spoken truth brings into being is good. Spoken truth brings reality into being, brings good reality into being. God's spoken truth, God's word brought the world into being through his word, right? So the phenomenon becomes fully real or fully acted out. It's the same idea that faith is not just a propositional belief. Faith is actually a lived belief. It's an acted upon belief. Mm -hmm. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the full reality of the phenomenon of things that are being named or thought by man. That's what occurred to me. It's interesting. Now, as I was teasing that out, it reminded me of N.T. Wright's article, Loving to Know, where he's talking about the history of epistemology. And through this whole history of epistemology, and, and his article lines up so beautifully with Ian McGilchrist's ideas that I would love to see the two of those talk because it's this concept of the two different ways of knowing are like the two different hemispheres of the brain. And the loving to know is this sense of you kind there's a kind of a radar that you're not even aware of that, that your right hemisphere is acting on bringing in knowledge from outside that's undifferentiated knowledge and it comes in gets transferred over to the left hemisphere and then the left hemisphere analyzes it cuts it up into pieces makes something out of it right he calls that loving to know and so in my mind i just flipped it and i said well you know how you say sometimes people say i eat to live and other people say i live to eat well Am I loving to know? Am I loving in order to know? Is, is that the meaning of it, that I'm loving? My willingness to love this external source that's out there, mm -hmm. my willingness mm -hmm. to love that source enables me to know in a different way. Loving first and then knowing. Yeah. And if I flip that, the other side would be knowing in order to love. And my brain went down this funny rabbit trail. Well, there is this thing between men and women that I think is universal. I know it's certainly true in my life that as a woman, my, my approach is to love um, well, let me flip it first. 
the knowing to love, which is the opposite, mm -hmm. I noticed that for my husband, it's much easier for him to talk intimately with me about things that are deeply meaningful to him mm -hmm. after the act of love. Right, right. So, so the knowing in the sense of the biblical knowing, let's use knowing right. in that sense, right? The knowing for him comes first, and then the love, the deeply, deeply meaningful communication. And for me, as a woman, the, the loving or the acting out or the risking of open-hearted communication, for me, always comes first before the knowing, before the union. So it occurred to me that the, it's very similar to these two hemispheres of the brain. Yeah. The masculine, the, the feminine approach is to risk letting in this outside source that, that I'm, I'm willing to love, be open, be, um, let this outside source approach and become one with me. And then the left hemisphere of my brain gets that um, goes through the process of knowing, taking it all apart, and then tries to get to the tries to get that to the place of being able to love, to be able to yeah, I can't I just can't quite put my hand on it. But anyway. <laughs> I think I think we've stumbled on some really important things, which is I think we, we, we talked about this last time. I, that the male female dynamic is at the heart of all reality, mm -hmm. that there's something there that is way, way deeper about the nature of reality rather than some artifact of, of Darwinian natural selection. Um, I think that's really clear. Also, when you were talking about Barfield and, and the quote from Barfield earlier, it, it brought to mind very quickly, um, you know, Tolkien's ideas of our, our role as sub creators in terms of how the world lays itself out, um, which obviously plays out in Genesis with, with Adam's naming of all the creatures. Um, but um, Tolkien was very influenced by Barfield in terms of, of developing that philosophy. That's something maybe we could look at in future. But I, I don't know, something's, something really interesting is at play here. And I, I have very low resolution <laughs> perceptions on it. Um, also, this, this alignment with this spirit being aligned to hope and, and Jesus, the word, being aligned to faith and, and God, the Father, aligned to love. There's something going on interesting there. Um, Yeah, I I feel like it. I feel like it's it's too big for me to. <laughs> oh man, I don't know where which direction to go in. Um, but that was that was very interesting. Where like, you know, from the right brain, left brain. You, so from a feminine perspective, is it's got to take in the outside, somewhat un uncritically. Mm -hmm. Um. Hmm. Yeah, it's got something to do with risk. Um, it's got something to do with the risk, the, the, the dynamic of risk and sacrifice. Because the, the feminine risks and the masculine sacrifices. Hmm. And so that, that plays into it as well somehow. Um, but where it gets confusing, here's where it gets, here's why it's, here's why I think it's hard to put together is that these are truths that are built into the substructure of the universe. And part of what we're saying from what Barfield is talking about in his book is that 
to some extent, we've lost a grasp of what that actually looks like because we've gone so far in the direction of the dialectical building of towers upward and upward and upward and breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces that we no longer can really grasp the wholeness of this thing because it, there is, it's a wholeness here. It's not two things. It's, you know, this is one of the reasons I think this is one of the reasons I think Jordan Peterson's accomplishment is so phenomenal that he was able to hold these ideas in his head long enough mm -hmm. to write them out in some sort of fairly comprehensive way in Maps of Meaning and at, yeah. at least sketch out, you know, even though it's not complete by any means, he has at least sketched out a sort of a picture that we can get, right? Yeah. So I liked what you said about taking in the, this global knowledge, taking it in uncritically. But then that gets exactly to what you were, you and I were talking about via email about the dangers of some of the postmodern way of thinking, because there's so much of postmodernism that is very, very close to the truth. And mm -hmm. because it's very, very close to the truth, people want to grab onto it as though it's the complete idea. Yeah. And really there's yeah. a big piece of it missing. Right. Because I, I think the problem with, with critical theory in postmodernism is that it it presents itself as a replacement for science in certain respects, right? Because it's trying, I mean, in the article you sent me, like it was, it's trying to topple down this, this hierarchy uh, because science and science is obviously one of the most uh, valuable hierarchies to go after because it's become so powerful and has so much status in the West. And there's um, there's invariably truth in their perspective. And I think, you know, denials of that truth only empower the critical theorists more because they, they can, there's this, this seductive quality to their, their simplistic rendition of things because it, of it, because of, Anytime you want to act or make a choice, having a more simplistic, lower resolution map is, is more useful. I think G.K. Chesterton got into this as well when he was saying, like, if you, if you argue with an insane person, you're probably going to get the worst of it because their kind of smaller circle, their lower resolution map of things allows them to run through their matrix of... Uh, of decision making much faster than you can, so they they uh, they get there ahead of you and you know um, and kind of beat you to the punch. And I think that's what we're seeing right now because there's a there's a sophistication that's necessary to to answer their critique that has to take in their knowledge as well. The things that they say that are true has to be incorporated into whatever we do next. Um, and so we, we can't, and I think a lot of people, they want to fall back to modernism. That's, I think what the new atheist and what even Jordan Peterson to some extent might, um, I think he's, he's working his way towards some third solution, but he's also in the meantime, wants to put the brakes on, um, on these postmodern movements. And I don't think we can, I think trying to put the brakes on them is giving them even more flame because it's, it's the denial of the truths that they see makes it look like you're, you're uh, like you're standing up for the oppressors of history and things of that nature. It becomes very quickly, you become tainted immediately by evil by trying to do some sort of, denial action or to minimize or say, yeah, that happened, but it's not that important or it's, it's not the whole story. So it's, um, 
I, that, and that, that's why I think this, this word participates is such a great word because participates is, is the right level of sophistication to talk about how all these things interact. There is no thing that you can say is at the top of the hierarchy. You can say something participates within this interplay of things, but it's one of many things that participates. And I, I think, um, we have to become from when I think about this, I think, well, how do we, how do we enable a sort of pluralism in the society that, that enables competing religious points of view um, without um, it's, it's like, it's the whole problem with the religion without a religion. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to get there because, you know, like for instance, you know, when, when the founding fathers said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now they wrote that in a particular cultural frame that had all these Judeo Christian things built into it that to some extent we're losing or don't, or are, have become unmoored from right now. So that self-evident quality it was a was a it was their cultural lens of their day that made it self-evident and we've it i don't know that i don't know that we we necessarily in that frame any longer so how do how do we reconstruct it is 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 one that it's a very worrying um situation we're in we're in we're kind of in this liminal space between two different well, and, and part of that problem, the, the one you just brought up about the framers, um, that problem is that we can no longer frame the world the same way because our education no longer provides the same foundation that, from which they were working. Up until that point, they all had the same foundation from which they were working. They were studying John Stuart Mill and Edmund Burke and all these people, and they and, and they all knew Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, and, and they knew the foundations of Western civilization, and they had that common ground. But our educational system the last 40 or 60 years, that, that has all but disappeared. I mean, <clears throat> I never learned any of those things in, until long after I left college <laughs> and, and only learned as much as I've been able to chase down myself. So. Um, and there are a whole lot of people today that, that don't get any of that in their educational system. But, but I, I need to leave a little early today, so I wanted to kind of wrap this up and go sure. back to what you said about participates because all of a sudden the bells and whistles went off. Oh, I get what you mean now by participates being, um, you said that um, participates is a useful word because it shows that it's only one, we, we participate in this problem because it's one of many things that caused this problem. In other words, participates is made up of that word part. There are many parts and the, the ancients used to participate in the world in the sense that they, they, their default setting was that they saw themselves as part of the world. They saw themselves as a microcosm within the larger macrocosm. They saw themselves as being nested within all of these different aspects of the world. So, so a man in those days would see himself as nested within the hierarchy of, of masculinity and the woman would see herself as nested within the higher, not the hierarchy, but nested within the the ground of being, the ground of the, the source of, of uh, you know, the source of right. the future, right? Women could see themselves as that because that was their participation in the world. That was their default setting. And, 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 and it, <laughs> it allowed them to see things like, okay, I have real agency, but they could also believe in something like fate at the same time. Like, I don't, like today we can't resolve that. It's like, well, if you believe in uh, fate, 
or you believe in some sort of destiny, you're, you're ruling out agency. Um, and we, we have real problems with that today of managing the complexity of whether and it's built into all this critical theory as well. Who has agency is a big part of, and where does the agency live? Is, is it in some sort of spiritual reality, like, you know, institutional racism? Is that what's really pulling the strings of society? Or, you know, where is the agency located? We, we have a hard time seeing it distributed. You know, because we've we've gotten into the scientific frame where we, you know, this is where I said, um, you know, the the phrase racism causes inequality is problematic because in the scientific frame, that word causes might as well just be an arrow, or even more perniciously, it might just be an equal sign. Where the complexities therein are, and as soon as you make it an equal sign, all bets are off because you can play. If this equals this, if this equals this, you get these transitive properties in mathematics where you can say the craziest thing and it can become true. Like, you know, in that, that science article you sent me, essentially rapes laws of motion become a Newton's laws of motion become Newton's rape manual because of that linking back to the, the male hierarchy. This equals this equals this equals this. Newton's laws of motion equals Newton's rape manual. And that sort of like flattening of the complexities of reality is, is frightening to behold, but you can see how seductive it is. Um, especially for, for somebody who's looking for an excuse to act out of a, a particular mode of resentment. It's really frightening to behold. Well, and, and we all, we all want to look for patterns. I mean, we have this natural propensity to look for patterns and some of us have more of a propensity to see conspiracy inside every set of patterns and so when you start seeing these these things nested inside nested inside and and this equals that pretty soon you, you have this pattern that just complete you know it's confirmation bias i guess but it's such a natural uh, natural desire on our part well listen um let's continue with barfield next time but let's talk about the um his conversation Mark Vernon's conversation with John Berbeke about Barfield and about, um, I think they're also gonna be talking about the different ways of knowing, is that? Um, you listened more to that video than I did, but let's follow that thread and see if we can tease out some more. Cause I, I really want to, this whole thing of the masculine and the feminine being actually at the base of the nature of reality, I think that's a very, very important road to go down. And there's yeah. a lot more there. It's gonna take some doing to tease it apart, yeah. but maybe we can we can go somewhere with it. Yeah, sounds really good. Awesome. Super good seeing you, Michael. Congratulations. And <laughs> Thank you. Think of what kind of art you would like gracing your walls. I can do anywhere. For shipping, I can't ship anything much larger than about a uh, maybe 30 by 40 or something like that, but I can go as small okay. as 12 by 12. So okay, depends on what you're looking for. Okay. I'll, I'll be thinking about it. <laughs> okay. Have a great week. I'll see you All right, next thanks. week. Thanks. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye.